The tenth muse. That is what Plato called the poet Sappho. Her 3,000 year old songs are as relevant and meaningful today as they've ever been. And the mysteries surrounding her life and her sexuality are hot topics for scholars still. But was she a lesbian herself? Those details, they can be hard to pin down. I'll talk to Diane Rayer. She's translated famous works like Antigone and Medea. And she's also one of the leading experts and translators of Sappho. She wrote the book, Sappho, a new translation of the complete works. She joins me today on Gay History with Tom Ransweiler. Diane Rayer, thank you so much for being here and doing this. Thank you, my pleasure. For the people who are not familiar with Sappho or why she is famous, can you give us kind of the spark notes on her and her life and what we do know? Sure. She lived on the island of Lesbos at about 600 BCE. We know that's when she was an adult anyway. And uh, she lived in the main city of Mytilene. And she's the very earliest female poet that we have from ancient Greece, and by far the most famous. Uh, we don't know a lot of, of details about her life because we, we have basically th three main sources. We have her poetry, what remains of it. Uh, so that's where I take most of my lead. We also have testimony e from later authors who have told us some things. And then we have our historical knowledge of her context on the island of Lesbos. And so from those, um, and mostly again from her poetry, we know that she must have been an aristocratic woman. Um, she writes about her mother, her daughter, Cleus. Um, uh, she writes about three brothers. She must have been married because everyone got married. But the reason she's so famous is because she's the earliest Greek woman poet and was extremely famous in her time and pretty much from them on. One modern artist once wrote about Sappho, if we had the complete works of Sappho, it is quite possible that we would never recall Homer. How much of her work uh -huh. survives? Like how much do we have? I uh, translated um, the complete works of Sappho. So that that's this. Um, and uh, that title was kind of a joke because of course we don't have the complete, right? But we, all the little scraps. So there's, she must have had in uh, antiquity about 10,000 lines of poetry. There were nine collected books, you know, scrolls of her poems. Um, and we have about 750 to, no, about 650 to 700 lines of poetry surviving. So we have a really tiny amount. That's because a lot was found on papyrus. And so there's holes. <laughs> yeah. And that's frustrating. That's so frustrating. <laughs> yeah. So there's all these little bits and pieces that yeah. we've got from lots of different sources. To think that there were 10,000 lines at one point, and now yeah. we have about, what were you saying? About 200. 650. 650, uh, yeah. That's lines, yeah. Mind-blowing and just frustrating for anyone. <laughs> yeah. Because it's like, we want more. Yes, <laughs> we want more. <laughs> so in, her, in her poetry, one thing that I found so interesting is that I was listening to a podcast you had turned me on to called Sweet Bitter. Yes. And we host the podcast say her poems were more like, songs and they compared her more yes. to the Taylor Swift of her day rather than the Maya Angelou of her time. Yeah, all of her, what we call poems, Sappho's poems were songs. Um, that's where we get the word uh, lyrics from is she played them to the ancient stringed instrument, the lyre. Uh, uh -huh. So everything was performed. So even when it sounds like diary or really, really private, Yeah. Picture modern singers who sing very personal sounding lyrics. We have to always picture every bit that we have in performance. That, that's really critical to picture Sappho singing to an audience, probably of her women friends 
or for bigger like festivals for a mixed sex audience or you know wedding songs she has or ritual ones all of it is performance all of it would have, have been sung by sappho if there were some some probably are choral poems in mm -hmm. which case they might have been sung by more or uh, like young women or girls that's incredible just to think about think about sappho <laughs> in an amphitheater just singing these deeply personal lines when you and yeah. i would go to a concert today and just sing along with the rolling stone it's like it's very it's very cool to think think about but there's yeah. this great debate that just rages on and on about the sexuality of sappho how, yes how much of her of her i want to say poems but really lyrics are about women this is a little complex yeah. um but and it goes back to these being performed so Picture Sappho would be performing for women she knows, her community that she knows, right? She wasn't a traveling poet, like some of the, the later male poets who traveled around and performed. Later people performed Sappho cover songs, for example, right? But um, in her time, she would have been performing for community. So she would be singing things that would be of interest to her community. Right? So they'd be personal, but they'd also be applicable. Right? So um, we know that Sappho's lyrics are quite definitely homoerotic. There is no doubt about that. Um, they're intensely homoerotic. They're intensely full of desire. Many of them are directed specifically toward women. Um, here, let me. Um, Please. Uh, this is poem 96. Pacing far away, her gentle heart devoured by powerful desire, she remembers slender Attis. Oh, okay? wow. So it's very specific. It's a, a she mm -hmm. who is desiring another woman. There is no doubt. So what we have in her poetry is definitely desire for women. Mm -hmm. What we don't know, and that's why it, it sounds like I'm being cagey, but I'm not, um, is that we have no idea who the poet Sappho actually had sex with, just to be very <laughs> blunt about it, right? I mean, think about what people put in songs, right? It doesn't mean that it's a diary, yeah. right? And male lyric poets who wrote erotic poetry, they talked, they sung about, uh, um, you know, affairs with men, affairs with women. Um, it doesn't mean they were, you know, having sex with everybody. Yeah. Right? Um, it means that's what they had personal knowledge of and knew their audiences were interested in. But what we do know is her poetry was intensely women centered, right? And lots of her poetry is talking directly to women about women. Um, and her poetry is full of desire. Mm -hmm. It's not all um, just directed at women though. Everything, it, whether it's talking about memory or poetry or uh, you know, where poems where you can't even tell who is, who is it directed toward. We assume it's Sappho as the speaker, right? Yeah. Um, but it doesn't mean she could be doing different personas, you know, mm -hmm. all sorts of different possibilities. Yeah. And I want to get back yeah. to that point you had made about her, her, her poems being very illicit when it comes to drawing homoerotic images of yes. women. And uh, one of your translations is fragment 31. Yes. So read that real quick if you, if you don't mind. Oh, um, please. <laughs> I love how excited you are just as excited as I am just to read anything. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you get just as I see like the light in your eyes. I'm like, this is great. You get so excited. Yes. The translation reads, to me, it seems that man has the fortune of gods, whoever sits beside you and close who listens to you, sweetly speaking and laughing temptingly. My heart flutters in my breast whenever I quickly glance at you. I can say nothing. My tongue is broken. A delicate fire runs under my skin. My eyes see nothing. 
my ears roar. Cold sweat rushes down me. Trembling seizes me. I am greener than grass. To myself, I seem needing but little to die. Yet all can be dared since, and that's it. That's all we have. How frustrating. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that to me, one, like it sums up my interpretation. When I read it, it sums up everything you feel when you really desire someone. You have like a huge crush on somebody. Yes. And you see them liking someone else and you're like, come on, just come and like me. And it's very yes. clearly kind of about a woman. How else could this be interpreted? This is a poem about desire. And yeah. actually, we're very fortunate that we have this much of it. Uh, Longinus quoted it uh, and on his uh, treaty, treatise on, on the sublime. Yeah. And he quotes this, but for, unfortunately, he doesn't quite finish it, right? Mm -hmm. But your immediate reaction is so perfect. And this is what draw, has drawn me to Sappho ever since I first read her as a junior in college, <laughs> um, because it is so direct, it is so passionate, and the passion is directed toward a woman. And so if we assume Sappho as speaker, then yes, woman to woman, clearly, right? However, Sappho has this, this fluidity, really this kind of queer effect here mm -hmm. where it doesn't matter who the speaker is because your reaction is everyone's reaction. When you read this poem, it's like, oh my God, this is exactly what I have felt, yeah. right? She is putting into words that passion, that desire. But yes, if we're picturing Sappho and it's definitely desire for another woman, right? But look how little of the poem is about the other woman, yeah. right? The poem is about I see you, and when I see you, I can't even talk. My tongue is broken, yeah. right? And of course, she says it in these gorgeous, intricate lyrics. I got the chills. Lyrics. I don't know if you can see. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the thing about it. Is So it's beautifully written, but she's saying, I see you, and I can't talk. I, you know... Every, all these symptoms, I've got this delicate fire running under my skin. Oh my God, doesn't that just do it to you? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and so she's describing step by step how every physical feeling in that. One thing I want to mention, because so many people, I mean, I probably shouldn't say this, get it wrong, but it is, um, that they focus on the man. And Sappho does not focus on the man. In, and this is where it's so important to get an accurate translation, mm -hmm. which is where my translations come in, because they're very precise. And this poem says, that man, whoever he is. So it's not talking about a specific dude sitting next to her beloved. It's like some guy can sit next to you and talk to you and listen to your tempting laughter and he doesn't pass out. But me, I'm just looking at you. Ah, <laughs> you know? Yes. I'm telling you, I've had the chills since we've been speaking about this. It's so, because it's so to think that these thousands of years ago, those same exact feelings that human experience yes. that was capturing, we have today, even with you would think you would think all this technology, which is numb us to anything, but these feelings were primal and they are real and they're within us the way they were within Sappho. It's yes. wild. Yeah. Um, and I'm so glad you talked about the translation because I want to ask you about that. It is so important, right? When you, when, when talking about translations to understand that when Sappho was writing the language she was using, it, it's, there's not always a direct correlation between words that we use today and words she was using then. And that's why it's so important. Yes. The interpreter is almost as important as the writer, right? They're the same thing because yeah. okay so I read the poem in Greek mm -hmm. using the very best up-to-date texts you know editions of the Greek that I can find so yeah. I keep up on all the scholarship all of that right mm -hmm. and then I 
interpret the poem as any reader does, right? You read the poem, therefore you interpret the poem. Mm -hmm. Then I write and I try to be as Sappho as I can, right? Yeah. But it, any translation goes through somebody, which is why everybody should read Greek, right? Yeah. But everybody doesn't. So yeah. the translator has a responsibility to be very clear what is there. There's all sorts of things that don't, you can't just lay tracing paper over it, right? And yeah. come out in English. Let me give you an example from this poem, okay? Mm -hmm. So I am greener than grass, mm -hmm. okay? And this is where people get the idea of jealousy because in English, right? We have green with jealousy. Green in archaic poetry never ever means has to do with jealousy. The word is, is the same word where we get chlorophyll. Interesting. Um, so chloro, uh, yeah, chloroterra. And, but green in Sappho's time meant like green wood. So it's new, fresh, moist, full of life, right? So uh, if Sappho wasn't such a good poet, it could be something more vulgar, like I'm wet. <laughs> <laughs> So it's like, so it doesn't have anything to do with jealousy, the green. It's this new, full of life, right? And grass too. We think of like suburban grass. Yeah. But grass in ancient Greek um, was a sign of fertility because in the Theogony, when the goddess Aphrodite steps on ground after she's born from the sea, the grass winds around her ankles and grows. And so whenever you see grass in archaic poetry, in really ancient Greek poetry, it has to do with fertility, sexuality. So when Sappho's saying, I'm full of life and this close to death, it's oh that whole, you know, it's that whole erotic feeling, that feeling of desire. Yeah that goes from every bit of your body, yeah. right? And so, what are, I'm yeah. sorry, what are the French, no, uh, they call an orgasm le, le petit mort? Is that it, like the little death? Yes, yeah, it's no. the climax, yes. you know, it, it, it's, yes. Um, and so all of that is in there. And another one on that poem, I actually gave you my updated translation oh, cool. that you read. Thank That'll you. be in the, yeah, I'm doing a revised updated paperback edition. Um, oh. That'll be way, way cheaper because <laughs> the hardback <laughs> is way too expensive. But anyway, so, uh, and I'm working on that right now. Um, so uh, hopefully it might even be out before the end of the year. Oh, but be um, the word in Greek, tolmatone, which it, I am now translating dared can also mean endured, which is how I have it in my earlier translations of Sappho. So because the word can either mean endured, all can be endured. That means, yeah, this is the way it is, right? And we just have to endure. But think of the difference. And the word can mean both. Dared, all can be dared. It's like, go girl. Yes. Right? <laughs> get it. Like, yeah, we don't know which translation is the one that Sappho had in mind. If we had another line or two, we would, but yeah. we don't. So that's how important translation is. How important, how important translation is and how frustrating it is that we don't have more. <laughs> I feel like yeah. I'm going to keep coming yeah. back and whining about it because I just want so much more from Sappho. Okay, but I can tell you that, that we probably will find more. Oh, that'd in, be great. Yeah, in 2004, um, a new papyrus was discovered that completed a poem that was extremely fragmentary before. It had been on papyrus that was torn, so we just had like this angled bit of it, and wow. there was another papyrus that just chunked right into it, like a puzzle piece. Oh my goodness, that's great. Yes. So a lot of the papyrus was found in uh, a garbage dump in Egypt, the Oxyrhynchus. Yes. So some because, of the greatest poetry ever written is laying in a garbage dump in Egypt. Possibly. Yes, because people would use papyrus 
and reuse it. And then when it was kind of worn out, you know, they would do other things with it and write on the other side. And then at some point it gets tossed. Mm -hmm. Okay. It gets old and it gets tossed. Well, because Egypt is so dry, some of the papyrus has been preserved, but a lot of it has dirt and is rolled, you know, in scrolls. And, but with new technology, it can read through the dirt. It could read through the scrolls. Wow. And so not just Sappho, but a lot more writing of, you know, whether it's laundry lists or, um, uh, you know, uh, biblical works, poetry, whatever, there's going to be more discoveries. Do we know how her contemporaries or the people in the hundreds of years following her life viewed Sappho and viewed the nature of her sexuality? Yeah, complicated. Her poetry was famous from her time on. Like I said, singers would have done cover songs of Sappho. And that's probably how a lot of it survived because she was immensely popular. Um, and even though there was a long chunk of time where we didn't really have bits of her work surviving, as more have been found, you know, she's had a resurgence, but people always had ideas of Sappho. Yeah. So some of those were like in an old, Athenian comedy, you know, where they made her just super licentious um, uh, or, you know, some have her as a prostitute, as, um, you know, like hypersexualized. Um, uh, there's that utterly ridiculous um, uh, one that probably was first in the comedy of Menander and then Ovid picked up up about her falling in love with a ferryman and committing suicide when he didn't love her back, you know, and then at various times she was as uh, condemned, you know, more modern um, uh, for being lesbian. And, and then uh, she was what, straight washed to be um, like, she was really just a school marm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and these were all her students. Yeah. There's ideas of Sappho that just go all different directions. They, they tried to make her as palatable as possible as time went on, which is yeah. know, not something that happened to these male poets. Oh, no. And they talk about men being interested in like teenage boys and, uh, you know, or, or other women. And so the poets like uh, a later poet, Anacreon, who's always talking about uh, his desire for this boy or, or that girl or, yeah. you know, and that doesn't get censored. Um, yeah. But Sappho's erotic lyrics, yeah, they got censored. What do you think it is about Sappho today that makes her work so popular still? I think that it has to do with that emphasis on eros, on desire, on passion mm -hmm. um, that infuses that longing, that infuses so much of her surviving poems um, and that her language is direct. And so it, it's like when you were reading 31 and you just feel it. That's how it is. We, we go, yes. And so it's important, definitely, that, you know, people can see her as the foremother of lesbian poets, right? Whatever, you know, we don't know about her personal sexuality, her poems are that way. But also that uh, fluidity, right? It, that anybody who is desiring can get in there. And it, it speaks to us, right? Because as human beings, we're full of desire. And so we recognize it. Um, and it's so pretty. Oh my God, is it pretty. <laughs> it is, it is. I, yeah. I want to thank you so much. This was just fantastic. And I really appreciate you taking the time to do it with me. My pleasure. Thank you very much for asking.